Hello. This lecture covers the three types of research sources, how you're likely to be using them now, and how to use them better. From most general to most specific, the three types of research sources are tertiary sources, which we also call reference sources, secondary, which we also call history books and articles, and primary sources. You use these in very different ways at different stages of your research, though you're likely to, to find you use them in overlapping ways. If for no other reason, then research is nonlinear to the point of being messy. Nevertheless, understanding what each kind of source is, what kind of information they provide, and how to use them might take some of that messiness out of your research. Let's begin with the most general source, which are broad and tend to be shallow, tertiary sources, also called reference sources. Encyclopedias are the most prominent form of tertiary or reference sources. They are, in fact, something of the platonic ideal of a tertiary source. The principal characteristic of a tertiary source is that it's built on secondary sources, though a primary source or two might creep in occasionally. And as we'll see, secondary sources offer interpretations of primary sources, synopses and glosses on the information in primary sources, if you will. So a tertiary source synthesizes the interpretations from secondary sources to provide an overview of the topic it addresses, as well as the topic's contours. What secondary sources think is important for you to know about the topic. You come away from a tertiary source with a basic understanding of that topic, but even more importantly for research, you come away with access points like dates, personal names, and events. For example, if you wanted to know about industrialization in the US during the Gilded Age, an encyclopedia tertiary source would lead you to Andrew Carnegie and his self-named steel company. But it might not lead you to US steel that was created after the Gilded Age. Similarly, constructing, similarly, searching encyclopedias for the Thirty Years' War in Europe will lead you to an event called the Defenestration of Prague of 1618, which triggered that war and is a fascinating event in itself. Tertiary sources are built on our next source type, secondary sources. In general, history books and academic journal articles are secondary sources, but some history books might be tertiary sources. Books are articles written by authors who rely almost exclusively on other books or articles fall into this category of tertiary sources. Textbooks are a good example of this. So instead, let's look at those kinds of history books and articles that are definitely secondary sources. We call these monographs. Monographs are about narrow topics and seek to interpret primary sources and evidence, often in light of the questions that other scholars have addressed or have missed. The important characteristics of a monograph are that the author consults mostly primary sources in the main thrust is to interpret the meaning of those primary sources. Generally speaking, a monograph is written so it offers an argument like what I ask you to write for this course based on claims supported by assertions and evidence and based on what other interpretations called historiography have to offer. Though it's not ironclad, we can say with some certainty that a telltale sign that a book is not a monograph is that it is first based mainly on other history books and that it tells a story rather than makes an argument. Let me compare two books as an example of this difference. Both concern the New Deal and the idea of fear as expressed by Franklin Roosevelt. 
David M. Kennedy's Freedom from Fear, The American People in Depression and War, 1929 through 1945, is extraordinary. It won the Pulitzer Prize in history in 2000. But it's not a monograph, though it shares many characteristics with monographs, including offering interpretations of history. It's not a monograph because its primary function is to tell a story based on other secondary sources. On the other hand, Ira Katz Nelson's book, Fear Itself, The New Deal and the Origins of Our Time, is indeed a monograph. It argues from primary sources that the New Deal was a U.S. response to the same things that led Europe into adopting totalitarianism and that the political motivation of fear continued to operate throughout the 1950s and steered national policy. Regardless of whether your secondary source is a narrative history or a monograph that argues a point, how you use that work is important. Unless you are very experienced, I suspect you use all books and articles in about the same way that you harvest data from them. That is, you grab factoids and stories and data that appear in that secondary source and use them for your own research, recounting but not interpreting them, and thus turning your own research paper into a tertiary source. That's a legitimate use of secondary works, especially given the limits on time and travel that you have to finish a class paper. However, in professional practice, there are next steps. In addition to harvesting data, consult secondary works for their interpretations. What is the author's claim or point? Knowing this, you can include the author in your historiography, your academic conversation, so to speak, about where your own interpretation falls. Also, Figure out what questions the author wants to answer. Doing so might strengthen your own research. And finally, and we'll talk about this a bit more in the lecture about finding sources, you can mine the footnotes and pillage the bibliographies of secondary sources to add to your own research. Remember, even the best authors leave out more than they put in. So the sources they used might tell you things that you couldn't find from the secondary sources under consultation. Let's talk about those sources that authors use to write secondary sources. We call these primary sources, and they are the foundation of advanced historical research. The simplest definition is that primary sources are contemporary writings about the events under consideration. But the best primary sources are not interpretive in that they are not retrospectives on events that happened in the near past, and they do not offer interpretations of those events. Another label that might help you make better sense of primary sources comes from Kyvig and Marty's textbook, Nearby History. They call primary sources, traces of events under consideration left by participants. The line between contemporary writings and traces is not clear cut, but it's also not particularly necessary that you make a hard and fast choice when considering a source. Remember this, the best primary sources are those that were created at the time of an event or during the occurrence itself and do not try to interpret that event or influence the historical record after the event. Primary sources also tend to be created by participants or by recent observers. We see primary sources more clearly when we look at some of their types. Reports from government and private entities, as well as papers that such entities generated during the course of business. For example, the minutes of a board of directors meeting is a great primary source. It is both a contemporary writing and a trace. Financial reports and committee reports are similar primary sources. For individuals, 
Letters and diaries are usually solid primary sources. Of course, you must critically read all sources, but when you find yourself looking for primary sources to analyze, letters and diaries are pretty solid. Don't shy away from published sources as primary material. Newspaper reports written at about the time of events they report are classic primary sources. Again, read them critically. Other times, important documents find their way into publication, but are primary sources. For example, in US history, the multi-volume official records of the War of the Rebellion, which we also call the OR, are the Union and Confederate archives published by order of Congress. Similar projects are the edited papers of various presidents and founders of the US, the American state papers that have an interesting history of their own, and in England, the Georgian Papers Online, that is the archives of British monarchs George I through William IV. Photographs are another primary source, though you must remember that they are composed and tend to interpret the scene rather than merely record it. Artifacts and material culture might be the purest form of primary source, though historians have not thoroughly incorporated them into our way of thinking. However, historians have developed methods for critically examining material culture, artifacts, and the built environment to tease out clues to past lives. In summary, there are three types of research sources, tertiary, secondary, and primary that assist your research at different stages and in different ways. You use tertiary sources as references to find the contours of your topic as well as access points into its deeper study. You use secondary sources to find data and evidence, but more importantly, you use them for their authors' interpretations and research questions that you too can address. Almost as importantly, you can mine the footnotes and pillage the bibliographies of secondary sources to trace back and access for yourself the sources that they used. Finally, we discussed primary sources, the foundation of advanced research, most simply defined as contemporary writings and traces left by people concerned with the events you are researching. You will use all three of these kinds of sources and you will be most successful if you can distinguish them from each other and understand how to critically address them. This then ends the lecture. As always, thanks for your attention.